In this episode of the Western Zhou Dynasty, we are going to talk about the state of Qi, one of the first new autonomous states to be created under the Zhou Kingdom. It was also possibly the first state to be granted as an autonomous fiefdom to a non-royal family member of the Zhou Dynasty. So, how did Jiang Taigong approach the governance of this borderland state and what were the governing principles that grew this backwater of the kingdom into one of the wealthiest and most powerful states throughout the entirety of the Zhou Dynasty? Hello and welcome to the show where we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people from the first creator to the last imperial dynasty. More than 6,000 years of stories, one video at a time. Now, if you are looking to learn more about the rich culture and history of the Chinese peoples, then this channel is definitely the right place for you. Now, in the days after King Wu of Zhou or Zhou Wu Wang established the Zhou Dynasty and the Zhou Kingdom, it was decided that the entire realm would be carved up and secondary states would be created to serve at the pleasure of the Son of Heaven or Tianzi. Now, these newly created states would be granted to Zhou royal family members and also to exceptional officials that rendered outstanding services to the Zhou royal court. Now, of course, part of the reason was to reward them for the contributions and to ensure that there were strong bonds between the royal court and the regional lords. However, another important reason was that these secondary states would act as a shield for the Zhou Kingdom and the Zhou homelands and also as local centers of influence that would entrench Zhou culture and Zhou traditions into these far-flung lands. Jiang Taigong was among the first batch of people to be elevated into this new ruling class as the new lord of the state of Qi or Qi Guo. Now, he was also possibly the first non-royal family member to be conferred such an honor, uh, which was largely due to his pivotal contributions in both the planning and the execution of the campaign that overthrew the Shang Dynasty. Now, this newly created state will come with the title of Marquess of Qi or Qi Ho, and this title will be inherited by every successful leader or ruler of this state. However, most historical documents and records would refer to these rulers of the Qi state as dukes or Qi Gong. Now, this was mainly out of respect for the first ruler who was obviously Jiang Taigong, but it was also down to the numerous accomplishments of their successive rulers throughout history. The Qi state would be made up of the majority of today's Shantong region and also parts of southern Hebei. And it was a backwater region back in those days that was deep in the heart of Tong Yi lands. Now, Jiang Taigong's job as the ruler of Qi was to act as the easternmost shield to the Zhou Kingdom, and he was also tasked with assimilating the native Tongyi peoples into Zhou rule. Upon receiving his new posting and his orders, Jiang Taigong began making his way eastwards to take up this new position. Now, however, due to his age, come on, this guy was near 90 by now, uh, so due to his age, he made extremely slow progress, resting before evening came and only continuing the journey late in the mornings. After traveling at such a slow pace for a period of time, one of his attendants casually mentioned to him, I have heard that opportunities are difficult to come by but are easy to lose. You, my lord, are a traveler with a destination. However, you are taking your time to enjoy all the comforts and hospitality offered to you along the way. It baffles me, my lord, but the way you have acted thus far is not in keeping with a man with an important mission ahead of him. Now, this seemingly casual remark would jolt Jiang Taikong to his senses and it reminded him that he indeed still had an important job to do ahead of him. Now, with this realization, the entourage picked up the pace and tried to take as little breaks as possible to make up for the lost time on the road. 
Now, after a hard journey that most probably took months, Jiang Taikong and his entourage finally arrived at what would be the Qi State's capital at Yingqiu, which is around today's uh, Lingzi district in Shandong. It was early dawn when they arrived and thank goodness they arrived when they did because they were surprised to see that soldiers from the neighboring state of Lai or Lai Guo had crossed a river into their lands and were actually preparing to attack the city. Now the state of Lai or Lai Guo was a vassal state of the Shang dynasty and the Marquess of Lai or Lai Ho was a subject of the Shang court who managed to retain his lands and titles under King Wu's policy of, you know, causing as little disruptions as possible during the transition period. When he heard that Jiang Taikong was taking his own sweet time to get to the state of Qi, he felt that it was a perfect opportunity to expand his own lands by conquering Yingqiu before Jiang Taikong's arrival. And thus, they were equally caught off guard by the appearance of Jiang Taikong and his retinue uh, much earlier than they were expected. Now, after figuring out what was going on, the two sides quickly got into battle formation and a skirmish happened along the banks of the Zi River or Zi Sui. Now, with the brilliant strategist Jiang Taikong casually commanding his men from the comforts of his command tent, the soldiers from Lai were quickly dispatched without much incident. It was after the skirmish or small battle was over that Jiang Taikong had time to think. And thinking back, Jiang Taikong was extremely relieved that he made the decision to hurry to his new fiefdom instead of wasting time enjoying the restive lifestyle on the road. Now, if he had arrived just a fraction later, he would have lost his fiefdom before he even set foot on it. Now, having properly settled in, the first priority on Jiang Taikong's mind was to bring order or establish order in the land and to stabilize the sentiments of the people. Now, according to the luxuriant dew of spring and autumn or Chun Chiu Fan Lu, which was written by Han Dynasty Confucian scholar Dong Zhong Su, Jiang Taikong would summon the chief of justice in the state of Qi, this man by the name of Ying Tang and ask his opinion on how to rule the locals. When questioned by Jiang Taikong, this was how Ying Tang replied, My lord, I believe you should rule with benevolence and honor. How then would you define benevolence and honor? My lord, the benevolent will love the people and the honorable will respect their elders. Right, right. How then would one love the people and how would one respect their elders? I believe, my lord, that the benevolent man would not allow his own son to suffer the labors and he would ensure that his son would get the best foods. And the honorable man who takes an older wife would treat her with the respect and the deference that was expected of a junior. Now, upon hearing these answers, Jiang Taikong flew into a rage and ordered his execution, telling him the following, I do so wish to govern with benevolence and honor, but you, you are creating chaos in the state with your twisted misinterpretation of these terms of benevolence and honor. In order to right these gross misconceptions that you have spread among the people, I shall have to execute you immediately. Now, the reason for this furious anger, this rage that Jiang Taikong flew into was that the Zhou definition of benevolence is a universal love that seeks to fulfill the greatest potential of the community and of each individual. It is not just a selfish love that one would have for his own family and people close to himself. And the Zhou idea of honor and righteousness was in the proper respect and deference to a person's position in social hierarchy which was earned through the contributions he or she made to the community and would come before a person's age or familial ties. 
Now, through Ying Tang's answers, what he was advocating was for the people to place self-interest and familial bonds uh, above the greater communal benefits of society. Now, if a state was governed with that principle, uh, it would not be long before social harmony would break down and the land would be thrown into chaos. Now, another story related by Han Feizi, a very well-known scholar and philosopher of the late Warring States period, told of two brothers, Kuang Yu and Hua Shi, who were well-known sages that lived on the coast of Qi when Jiang Taigong took over and became the ruler. And these two brothers actually openly stated the following, We recognize no sovereigns and we befriend no lords. We eat what we farm with our own hands, and we drink from the wells we dug. And we have no favours to ask from any man. We want no titles from any king, nor do we want salary from any rulers. We refuse to serve any court, and will leave off our own physical labours. So what do you think happened to them? You most probably wouldn't guess. When Jiang Taikong heard about their statement, he had them arrested and they would have the dubious honor of being the first people to be executed under Jiang Taikong's rule. But wait, weren't the Zhou people known for being kind and benevolent and being open and, and respectful to all forms of wise men and sages and talents? Yeah. But I guess Jiang Taikong had a pretty good reason for doing what he did because when Zhou Gong heard of this incident, he sent an urgent message from the capital to ask why he would execute possibly the two most well-known sages in the state of Qi as the first thing he did when he took over. Jiang Taigong simply replied that since the two brothers would recognize no sovereigns and serve no court, and they would only work for their own benefit through their own labors, they were practically useless to society no matter how talented or famous they were. And since they were arrogant enough to think that they were too wise and too good to be the subject of any king or ruler, and openly advocated for the rejection of social order, then their only use will come from being executed as a signal of his intention to ensure social order be upheld at all costs. Now being born and raised among the Tongyi people in the region, Jiang Taikong understood the need for a firm hand when dealing with the native peoples. Now he needed to establish his authority and send a clear message to his new subjects, uh, basically to prevent future obstructions in implementing his intended policies. And thus, his methods were quite a stark contrast to the gentler touch employed by the local rulers or the regional lords of the majority of the other states that were created at this time in the Zhou Kingdom. Now, the executions were brutal but necessary in establishing Jiang Taikong's authority as the new ruler of these lands. But please remember that he was not a cold-hearted murderer with eyes flowing through his veins. Because once the intended effect was achieved, he went on to seek out the local talents to serve in his court. And this exercise was something that he conducted in quite a different manner from most of the other lords of the land. While most of the other states in the kingdom would appoint officials based on heavy considerations of their bloodlines, Jiang Taikong would employ basically anyone who could pass the requirements that he laid out, regardless of their background and their social status at that time. And thus, a large portion of his court and even local officials were made up of the talented natives that were willing to serve. He also treated his officials with great respect and made sure that they were well rewarded for their efforts. And this open recruitment policy resulted in a huge influx of new immigrants that wished to serve but were unable to do so, were unable to get the opportunity in the other states. Now, in Jiang Taikong state of Qi, everyone was appointed based on their capabilities and they were deployed in positions that made the most out of their natural talents. And this greatly improved the efficiency of the government and greatly accelerated economic growth in the state. 
When the people saw that even the natives were given the chances and opportunities to serve in government and face no discriminations whatsoever, the distrust and the anxiety that they previously held slowly faded away. The localization and the simplification of Zhou protocols and etiquettes to suit the local culture and traditions also greatly accelerated the assimilation of the local population into Zhou Ru. Now, having grown up in the region, Jiang Taigong was extremely familiar with the resources available on his lands. Now, although the state of Qi was an undeveloped backwater on the eastern coast of the realm compared to the Zhou heartlands, it held rich reserves of metals and had easy access to the sea. So, in another departure from the usual route of building a predominantly agrarian society like most of the other states under the Zhou Kingdom, Jiang Taigong used the geographical advantages of his state to develop agriculture, industry, and trade all at the same time. On one hand, he deployed a portion of his population to reclaiming lands to be used as farms for grains and other raw materials like growing mulberry trees for silk production. Now, while at the same time, he opened up mines and smelters to extract the rich metal reserves available on his lands. Having access to the sea also meant that Jiang Taigong had the unique advantage of developing a fishery industry, but more importantly, he opened up sultans to produce sea salt, which as we all know is an extremely valuable commodity across the entire ancient world. Now, this next industry is something you most probably would not expect, because under Jiang Taigong's watch, the yarn and fabric production rates were greatly increased, which basically resulted in a booming fashion industry for the state of Qi. Now, due to the convenient location of the Qi state having access to both sea and land routes, trade was quickly established with the rest of the kingdom, and salt and metal were sold to basically every single corner of the Zhou Kingdom, and even the shoes and the boots and the clothing made in the Qi state became popular items across the realm. The lives of the people improved significantly due to the rapid economical growth, and it was said that it only took five months for Jiang Taigong to send the first report of positive growth back to the Zhou capital, and it was an event that shocked everyone in the central court. Now, as we mentioned many times before, Jiang Taigong served as the Grand Counselor or Tai Shi of the Zhou Royal Court, and thus he would spend a lot of time in the Royal Court rather than in his own fiefdom of Qi. Now, during the rebellion of the Three Guards or San Jian Zi Ruan, he was sent back to the state of Qi after completing all the planning stages of the military actions and military campaigns for Zhou Gong's Eastern Campaign. Upon his departure from the capital, King Cheng of Zhou or Zhou Cheng Wang actually gave Jiang Taigong special authority to launch military action and invasions against anyone who was involved with the rebellion in the East, regardless of their rank and title. And this would result in the state of Qi expanding beyond their initial borders through the annexation of several smaller neighboring states that actually had the balls to take part in the rebellion. By this time, the Qi state had grown from a poor, undeveloped backwater of the Zhou Kingdom into one of the wealthiest and most powerful states in the realm, and it would retain this reputation as a wealthy state of merchants all the way until the end of the Warring States era some 800 years later. Now, the Qi state will also produce some very outstanding rulers over the course of history, but as usual, we will get to their stories when the time comes. Now, if you enjoyed this story, it really helps the channel to give this video a like, comment, and share. And if you feel that I've done a halfway decent job of presenting these stories and would like to contribute to the running of the channel, you can do so on Patreon. The links are available in the description box down below. And with that, thank you so much for your time today. I'm upping all that Chinese history guy, and I will see you, you beautiful people out there, in the next episode.